Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. Hello, and welcome to another... Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarity, who nearly forgot the name of his own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely flawless opening from me as usual. Um, we have a question and answer episode for you, and I am joined again by Laura. Hello. 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 Um, so far, you hold the title of the only person, only guest I've had on this podcast, who has specifically had someone get in touch with me to say, Oh, they're really good, Woo-hoo. which is I've nice. I've got a fan. You got yeah. <laughs> Shout out to my fan. <laughs> they were like, "You should do. You you sound like you like each other." <laughs> I, like, I hope so. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> That's very nice. But they, uh, as per that uh, that individual's request, she's back. She's asking the questions. Now I've got to live up to it, though. I know. Well, that's the problem of having fans. <laughs> <laughs> You can only... You, I can was, only let them down. down is, I know, I was like, do I want to say that? That's quite harsh. Oh, the, only way from, the only way to go from here is down, Laura. Seems anyway, like let's it. have fun. Drop in, guys. So, now we've got a couple of uh, questions this week, haven't we? Yeah, we've got lots this week. Oh, that's lovely. So, what are you going to start with? I'll start you with a nice, easy one. So, <laughs> Jenny Cartledge has asked, um, what... Are your favourite archaeological books? My favourite archaeological books. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, well, we might as well start very early on in my archaeological career and say that Renfrew and Ban, uh, like many other people, is uh, you're looking at me like, like what is that? <laughs> Renfrew and Ban is like the introduction to archaeological practices. And I think they're on the 8th, ninth edition now, and every archaeology student gets it. And I'll tell you this as well, the number of people who are in their first and second years, uh, like the uh, last minute overnight essays with just Renfrew and Ban open in front of them going, ah, the answer must be in here. If the answer isn't in here, I am done for. Um, it's not quite uh, an archaeology book, but it's, it's an anthropology book. I really enjoyed Demonic Males. I thought that was quite interesting. Oh, I tried to read that. You tried to read it? Well, you didn't, it didn't No, take. I just never finished it. You just reminded me. <laughs> that was really good. Yeah. yeah. So I should definitely have That was a go. really nice one. Um, what other things? I, I, do you know what? I really enjoyed reading... Um, is it Julian... Bausch's Archaeology of Elizabethan Playhouses. It's a really nice sort of general kind of pop archaeology introduction to um, the physical evidence that we have for um, playhouses and theatres in London from the back end of the 16th, early 17th century, which is an area that obviously I'm interested in. And um, it also has quite a lot of the historical side of it as well. So kind of like the the impact that um the the development of playhouses and the fact that you know they very quickly f- went from these vagabond groups to by a uh, you know uh, an act of parliament telling them that you if you wanted to be an actor you had to have a permanent address that you could say that you worked from so in one you know that was that was supposed to be to control the actors and what it ended up doing was inventing playhouses because they all started building these purpose-built, you know, performance spaces, and um, I think I think he uh, he does a really good job of um, laying out everything that we know about them, and 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 painting a really interesting picture of a really um, exciting period of growth and change, and uh, you know. The, the sort of the green shoots of um, the English language becoming more poetic mm-hmm. because we were we were considered like if you if you were cultured you'd write things in French 
genuinely mm. it's sort of like oh yeah oh you read french how very fancy of you oh you wrote it in english well it must be a list for pub grub <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of it so when you start getting all of these guys working at the same time and it's only for like a really brief period like it lasts from 1570 to 1620s ish is sort of like the main playing time of things and then it it, it it changes again and then it becomes, you know, because the Puritans come in there like, no, this looks like fun. Stop it. <laughs> uh, and when we come back again in the Restoration, it's it's super different. You know, it's uh, the, the kind of theatre, the kind of audiences that it's aimed at has changed. But, yeah, for for like... I think you're ruining the book now for everyone. What? So you're like giving away the ending. Well, yeah. It's not giving away the ending. Like, the book... <laughs> the book... They don't the, need to read it, then. No, but the book very much... <laughs> the book shows us what physical evidence we have for all of this stuff. And it, it, you know, explains the shape of the playhouses and why they were built in that way. Um, and, yeah, it's just a, it's a really good foundation for, for further study in the area. <laughs> Sorry, clearly it, it, it's, it's a fun one. Yeah. Lovely stuff. Um, I have another one from someone called Tristan, who's actually asked uh, three questions. Oh, yes. But I'll start with one just because it's vaguely connected to that one. Um, and that's, what are your favourite podcasts to listen to, but non-archaeology specific? Non-archaeology specific. Non yeah. Well, I know, because people have... <laughs> Again, thank you very much for getting in contact. And if you want to send some questions of your own or any comments, please do so on at Ask an Ark. Uh, but I have had people come back to me like, "Oh, where? You know, I I lost an entire week t just listening to Behind the Bastards because of you." <laughs> um so I have already waxed lyrical about that, but I I will mention it again because it's really good. Um, uh, a sort of a a sister podcast to that one was I Don't Speak German, um, which was fascinating and is very sad uh, because it's an, an American and an English chap who uh, the American fella has spent years uh, listening to far right, alt right podcasts and YouTube channels and been on their message boards. And he just breaks down all of the various groups and people who are involved in far-right politics in America and what their tactics are to try and, and make themselves more mainstream. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting, but also at the same time you're like, well, oh, they have got quite far. <laughs> That's sad. Uh, so less sad. So I was, mm. Maybe less sad. Uh, Harmontown, that's fun. Um, uh, what else? I listened to the football ramble and have done so for, I think, the nine years that they've been a podcast. And I, you know me, I don't like football. I do. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember why I listened to the podcast? Isn't it's it, actually so archaeologically you, related. Oh, I thought so you could, like, fit in down the pub. It's not, <laughs> no, no, you're not far off. It's because I am the sheer number of building sites as a commercial archaeologist. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was. You end up on with sort of like, and it's amazing how that one and uh, the understanding of far right politics uh, really do <laughs> set you up to what talk to some builders. <laughs> like the guy who's like, do you like Chelsea? Like, yeah, I like Chelsea Football Club. So and so, so and so's doing really well. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Shame about all the immigrants. He's like, oh, boo. <laughs> that was a genuine conversation I had, and all of the conversation that we had with the man I was working with on uh, uh, down at London Bridge. <laughs> and it was a night shift. So I was with him for another 12 hours overnight, and we just stood in silence. <laughs> Like, we're not going to be friends. Yeah. You've tried <laughs> football and racism. Neither of those work. Uh, uh, cool. Any more? Yeah, I listen to too many podcasts, but I'll I'll probably leave it there. Is there any more I really want to plug? Uh, I, I like the Weekly Economics podcast. The Weekly Economics podcast? By the NEF, the New Economics Foundation. Yeah. That's my shout out. What do, why, what is it about you you like? It's just, it makes economics fun. 
<laughs> oh, wow. I know, I know. It sounds... I know no one asked me this question, but <laughs> yeah. I really like... I really like it. It makes really complicated subjects really digestible. Yeah, yeah. And it's quite funny as well. Brilliant. I also enjoy the dollop. That's a funny word. Mm. What? What is that? The dollop is an American history podcast uh, where one guy's researched a, frankly, ridiculous story from American history. Um and tells it to another person live on stage who has not heard uh, any of that history before. And, yeah, I mean, it does devolve into two white guys shouting at each other <laughs> by the middle of it. But the stories tend to be quite funny. And, you know, you know it often raises a, a, a smirk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, oh, I might as well stick with Tristan's questions from mm-hmm. here. So he says... Is there a hobby or topic that you have connected with someone on an excavation or project that had nothing to do with archaeology? No. Oh, so clearly not football or racism. No, no, no. <laughs> no, never never connected on the football and racism front. Um, has there ever been a time I've connected with someone from something that's non-archaeological? I take it beer doesn't count? <laughs> <laughs> um I try to think. I'm sure there's been occasions where, I you know, you just find yourself nattering, especially when you're like um, having to clean uh, soil. Yeah. And that could be quite a a doer experience. <laughs> Every time I see say clean soil, you giggle at that one. <laughs> it just amuses me. It is. Do you know what? One of the nicest site like worst sites i ever worked on because it was very much um it was the it was the 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 brooklyn's race course site where we had to do the <laughs> the historics that, yeah. yeah 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 and Didn't you sweep one like of my jobs was week? no i had to watch one of the site workers sweeping <laughs> the gravel off the race track and if he swept too hard i had to put the gravel back because <laughs> it's a national monument <laughs> So yeah, that was easy. But when I was working with the other guy um, on on site, there were there were two of us like, and one of us had to be up in a cherry picker taking photographs, and the other one had to be on uh, ground level, putting out all of the uh, the markers so that we um, had you know the the black and white crosses so that they're in the photographs and we could um, throw throw them in a computer program, stretch them to the right thing, and then create uh, sort of like an unbroken. Uh, scaled image of the racetrack, uh, which turns out to be quite difficult because it had banked corners. So it was you couldn't do a flat image because the corners actually turned to almost sort of 45, 50 degrees. Cool. So you're printing out this flat thing and all of a sudden it gets quite narrow at one end. And you're like, that's very odd looking. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we bonded over uh, uh, initially the fact that um, the racetrack was still live and I had to keep jumping out of the way of cars <laughs> whilst I was recording. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so you bonded over like near death. Like near death. That was the, that was the, the, the real icebreaker. But mostly um, he used to work in advertising in the 80s. And so he just was telling me stories of his life. And it was fascinating. We were there for two weeks and it was just the two of us. And it was like, surprisingly hard that i think there was a storm for the full two weeks we were there so he's swinging around in the cherry picker nearly getting flung out by the breeze and i'm jumping aside from cars <laughs> and then we'd go and have like a tea cake and a cup of tea and he'd he'd tell me about how he'd commute on concord and things like that wow yeah Same change of lifestyle well yeah it was a late life change to archaeology and so he was oh my god you should interview him yeah, he's not in archaeology anymore. Oh. He got basically he got uh, as far as I understand it, he got into a fight with one guy on a site and just went, "I'm actually considerably rich," and just left. <laughs> like, I don't need to be here. <laughs> don't need to be here. <laughs> Fair dues. I like that. Didn't you learn Italian on a site once? I've been taught Italian. Uh, yes, but like my Italian is uh, limited to. Uh, I think my glasses are ste- my goggles are steaming up. Important. Important. Um, and wheelbarrow and shovel and piccone, which is 
pickaxe. No. Uh, Cariola. Wheelbarrow. I also learned some... Um, yeah, like people keep because obviously you, you meet you people, work from, with people all from all over the world. So yeah. I've been taught uh, hello in I want to say Basque, uh-huh. <laughs> agur. Right. Or oh, that might be goodbye. I can't remember. Who knows what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing is they say that I've learned <laughs> all of these things, uh, but I fear uh, otherwise. Yeah. Very limited, very, very specific Italian. Our trip to Rome was not aided by me going, Cariola! <laughs> um, so Tristan, his final question, I'm not mm-hmm. sure if this is an invitation or, or what, but he's just what? asking, when are you next in Scotland? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, uh, actually, I don't know. I was supposed to be doing... Um, skeptics in a pub for Edinburgh and Glasgow skeptics next month but unfortunately it's fallen through but that means that we're trying to find replacement dates particularly for Glasgow um, so the answer is I don't know but I'll be back you know um, I'm going to be in Edinburgh probably for yeah. one weekend probably Edinburgh, right? probably Edinburgh but I don't know which weekend I'm going to be there I'm not doing the full run this year um, so I guess the first solid date I can give you is the full Edinburgh Festival 2020. Um, and whenever I can fit it in. Oh, no, that's not true. I'm in Dunbar in July. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm doing a special performance of uh, Practical Guide to Attacking Castles in a medieval, um, is it medieval? Sort of like. Don't ask me. <laughs> they're, they're, they're renovating a building there, um, and, and they've been using local sort of like. Oh, is this the charity? Game? Yeah, the charity one. So the the oh, cool. local younger uh, people who um, they're teaching to bricklay and do sort of like um, uh, repairs to stone buildings, which in Scotland is you know that's a decent trade, yeah. uh, particularly with the heritage focus. Um, and they've completed. They go, they, the the email's brilliant. It's like we've we've managed to put a roof on it. Would you like to come and perform? You're like yes, definitely. <laughs> y- yes. Now there's a roof because Scotland. Um. So yeah, in July. I can't remember the exact date. Oh, that's cool. But I'll, oh, uh, well, if I'll you're in Scotland, know. go support that one. Yeah, that'd be really that nice. That sounds really cool. Um. Okay. I've also just realised that um, there's another question here that is weirdly linked. Oh yeah. From Charlie T O K. Um this, what's the beef between archaeologists and linguists? The beef between archaeologists and linguists. Having just talked about Italian and Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, that is a good link. Um I actually I, is there one? <laughs> like maybe that's more up at the academic level and you know, because academics need to find something to argue about to justify their positions. Uh yeah, I mean <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. No, but neither. Then, yeah. But then, who knows? What? Well, if anyone's out there who is like, it, it, just at the the mention of either, you know, I was going to say at the mention of either archaeology or linguistics. But if you're flinching because you hear the word archaeology and you're listening to ask an archaeologist, <laughs> uh, or is it a joke, like, or a riddle? Is, is like, what's it's... the beef between archaeologists and linguists? <laughs> like, as in. Is there a cow standing between Tina's? <laughs> Famously, whenever you get a linguist and an archaeologist in a room, a cow will uh, just won't, will appear. Yeah. Well, so, well Charlie, T O K. Yeah. Thank you very much. But could you elucidate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could you expand on that? Because I should I'm, we should we be should, hating on linguists? Yeah. Should, is is this? Am I like letting the side down by not <laughs> actively being like? Boo! With your understanding of nouns. Boo! Or it might be, considering um, every single time I've taken notes on any site, I have refused point blank to use punctuation or spelling. Maybe they just find our like our site notes and they're like, "What are you doing to English? Please stop." Um. Okay. So mm. moving on. Yeah. Um. Teresa Omani. Mm. has tweeted um, what's going on for disabled or enabled archaeologists now this is a very interesting question 
there's a couple of things going on with archaeology with <clears throat> accessibility and i think one of the big ones from commercial was illustrated to me this week when i was at a site and they had um a disabled loo you know mm -hmm. had all of the facilities um but uh it was locked and to get the key you would have had to go up a flight of stairs and it wasn't a radar key thing. no it was a normal key and that's not unusual for sites to do that kind of thing um but upon pointing it out someone i was with was like well that's you know way down on a list of problems for accessibility mm -hmm. All the way across and they're not wrong a, a building site is you're constantly told to watch out for slips trips and falls when you are you know um, when you don't have problems with accessibility you know it, it, it's a difficult area to traverse when you haven't got any you know other needs or, or support requirements mm. so a building site can be quite a difficult environment to get people on. It's not impossible, but I think the perception from both sides is that it's very difficult. Um, add on to that the idea that people have in their heads of what archaeology is. Mm -hmm. the, part of the reason I do this podcast is to point out that there are more jobs in the heritage industry than just being a field archaeologist, just being the thing that is put on TV of you get into a hole, you dig, and you know, mm. you you pull things out of it. You know, that's a very physically demanding. It's a very um, difficult job, and even the people who do it, you know, <laughs> your body's wear down. Like, the reason I don't work outside anymore is because my back and my knees are shot. Mm. I, I'm, I've, I've given myself accessibility issues through wear and tear. But that perception of what it is to be an archaeologist should change. There are more than just working on building sites. Even on building sites, there are things that people can do no matter what their you know range of abilities are. You can work in processing, you can do... Um, sort of like surveying you can dig if you are if you're someone who you know doesn't require that much in the way of support there's nothing to stop you from going out there and, and, and digging right it's just that both sides I think have this preconception that it's going to be really difficult mm -hmm. but if you are on particularly big infrastructure jobs the whole thing is to make sure that it's part of health and safety to make sure these areas are accessible and it's getting more you know it's getting better and better you're getting things like handrails putting in temporary stairs put in place the accessibility to trenches is seen as a, a major requirement of health and safety but if they could just open that out a little bit more and start seeing it as a, a not just a health and safety requirement to make it safer and easier for people to move around but to design those things for everyone you know to be able to use them no matter what your you know how you view your your own sort of accessibility requirements if you could go for a wider range it would be possible to have people out there working in the field but beyond that you know there's more opportunities to it archaeology can be academic it can be information processing it can be conservation it can be buildings archaeology where you don't have to be you know doing heavy lifting but using the same processes and same um academic approaches and and, and recording techniques you know there's more than one thing but i think people sort of like have that image in their head and the general public have that image in their head and if someone is looking at it as a career they think that's the be all and end all of it and you know they they might be put off yeah. so i think there are a lot of good groups and i've been trying desperately to get um interviews with people who are talking about accessibility in this 
way. Uh, but I just haven't had anyone come back to me yet. Uh, like I've been to various press offices and I've heard nothing back. So this oh, is a, so if anybody knows yeah, someone who would like to talk about this. This is something I genuinely am really interested in and you know and I think it's something you're interested in as well, is understanding accessibility in this way. Yeah, definitely. And it's yeah. something I have a, an interest in as yeah. well. Which I won't go into here. No, you but, won't no, no. Um, but with building but sites. I was yeah. I was reading the other day that um so there was a survey out that it's like you're more likely to be able to get into a medieval castle than your local shop or pub yeah. as a disabled person. Yeah, and yeah. And that is shocking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also, well done heritage industry. I mean, in terms of like tourism and stuff, that mm. is, as opposed to, you know, digging there. And... Exactly. But, yeah. You can see, though, that there is a, there's a desire Certainly from certain aspects of it and, and definitely from, you know, sort of the public facing mm. tourist side of things that they want to make sure like, we're an excitable bunch who want to talk to everyone about everything that we know. And you can see that a, a, a natural kind of extension of that is get as many people in to see the sites. You know, the advantage archaeology has as an, a, a way of imparting stories is that we have the physical things, we have the places, we have the objects. But that means that we, you know, outside of advances in digital uh, engagement work, you have to get people to them. You have to get, you know, them into their hands or at least, you know, mm. within nose poking distance, you know, a foot away from the, you know, the glass, just like, face press up against it and that i think has been long recognized it's just the next hurdle is to make archaeology both like to make archaeology more accessible but importantly to make people who might immediately assume that it's not a job for them give them access to and um, sort of expose them to the variety of things that people can do if you want to work in heritage there's something you can do for it you know and then also help make the sites better well, yeah it goes the other way as well yeah, isn't yeah. it it's like people in charge of things need to realize yeah, that yeah, there yeah. are so many different roles yeah. involved and yeah there's different ways you can support people mm. um so yeah it's a it's a it's a big it's a big topic, but it's it's. We need someone to talk to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we definitely need someone to talk to. It's it's sort of like, I think I th I, my understanding of it is basically perception is one problem, and actual physical access is the other side of it. Yeah. But they're a feedback loop. If you make it more accessible and also show people that it's an option as a career, you'll get more people yeah. coming to be involved in it, and more people who are involved in it pushes the requirement for it to be more accessible so it's just who take who takes the leap first yeah, yeah, who yeah. makes that first push well i'm sure there are people out there doing it yeah and if any of them could get in touch with me <laughs> that would be super useful yeah um, but okay cool um so now i've got a question from someone called albert hackenstein mm -hmm. with a question i have no idea what it's about right it says, I've been reading about the Yuga Dryas impact. Yes. Seems to be a lot of evidence that it took place and hence suggested a website. And mm. then he says, also seems uh, a lot of emotional resistance to it. Do you have any views on this? Right. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, the Yuga Dryas impact. Uh, my understanding of this is it is a hypothesis as to why during the Yuga Dryas there was a sudden uh, dip in temperature. So what's 12,800 no, 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 no. so, uh, period. Twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, uh -huh. everything were, the earth was warming up right. and we were coming out of the ice age and now all of a sudden all the temperatures dropped massively. Okay? And that's called the Eugodryas period? Yes, that's, I think that's, yeah, that's the Eugodryas, right? Okay. So the Eugodryas impact is a theory to explain that um, change in temperature based on an impact of a uh, meteorite air bursting above North America 
and causing mass forest fires that um, melted an ice sheet and dumped a huge amount of cold water into the sea, which depressed global temperatures. Mm -hmm. Following? Roughly. Roughly. Right. So that's, that's the theory. And my understanding is the counterpoint to that theory is um, there have been no impact points found, no craters right. for this meteorite. Then the counterpoint again is, ah, but it was an airburst. You know, they all exploded in the atmosphere, which caused enough power to cause all of this devastation. To which the counterpoint again is, well, if they're small enough to only burst in the air, they're not powerful enough to cause the damage. But if they're powerful enough to cause the damage in the air, they would have got through the atmosphere and we would have found craters. Okay. So that's where we are with it. Right. right? And that's the problem. The evidence, the direct evidence of a meteorite strike 12,800 years ago is not there. So the rest of the evidence for it appears to be from secondary inference from like um, potential evidence from ice cores regarding forest fires and um, these like magnetic particles and micro diamonds and all this sort of stuff mm. yeah so the problem everyone has is and um, this is a really good example of um sort of like the biases in in academia is that one side sees that there is no direct 100 percent evidence you know we need we need the 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 evidence that specifically says there was a meteorite we need to find evidence of the meteorite, we need to find evidence of the strike or the evidence of explosion. The other side is going, but we have all of this evidence, but none of it directly relates to an impact. Mm -hmm. All of it is inferred. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it might not necessarily be datable to within the actual time that we think this strike took place. So it becomes kind of like, I'll go back to it again, it, it, it's that thing of... Um, uh, archaeology being when it's good is like a police investigation and in this instance it's all it's the circumstantial evidence is building the case there's no murder weapon because mm. no one's found the the meteorite but isn't that the case with a lot of archaeology like yeah you infer a lot yeah yeah, yeah. or that's you, what... yeah. you build up a case yeah, yeah, yeah like i don't know it always seems like you're joining it's like a dot to dot to me. <laughs> yeah, joining a dot to dot is a really good example. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it can be like, <laughs> yeah, you might get it wrong or whatever. Yeah, definitely. But that's so that's what you end up with. But um, the person asking this question as well asked specifically about this emotional reaction to mm. it, and that's where the arguments fall down. That's when academia seems to go badly. Is when one side tells the other side that their um, arguments are emotional uh, it it gets almost dismissive at that point and it, it the arguments between whether there is a meteor strike or not a meteor strike is good I think generally I think it's how it should work there should be opposing theories building up their evidence cases and peer reviewing each other mm. to see how it goes. But when you start dismissing one side as you don't agree with me because you're being emotional mm. and you don't want to you don't want to change your mind, you it it breaks the system because then you know it breaks down the debate because you don't want to interact with the other person because it basically called you, you know, like they they've essentially gone well, yeah, you're hysterical. Slap this man. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose that's outside of archaeology as well. That's mm. how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything breaks down, isn't it? When you yeah. move away from using just the facts, I know. and you move into using. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I emotional. don't know enough about this to come down on either side of it. It sounds like there are interesting points both ways, and I'd have to read a lot more before I could say either argument, but. Just from what, how I've seen it laid out, 
they both seem to have merits. They both question each other. They both, you know, have things that let each other down. And, and the evidence isn't overwhelming either way, necessarily. Um, and as long as people can continue viewing things in that kind of, like, measured, mm. the body of, you know, body of evidence sort of way, I think it's far more beneficial for the uh, discipline as a whole rather than when it starts to get to emotional levels. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I can't ask another question because your phone has locked out with all your questions on it. Mm, that's all right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and now I don't know where I am. <laughs> uh, yes. I think we're on to the last one. Okay, cool. So this is from Christian Varga, I think. Mm -hmm. Apologies if I've got that wrong. Um, and he asks, if you should storm a castle, yeah, which dinosaur would you ride? Oh, come on! <laughs> All right, let's let's approach. Right, okay. Um, he, he actually asked the more serious yeah, question. Yeah, we'll get to that in a but second. No. I like. I want to hear your answer to that. One All right, first. I'm going to need you to start. Right, I'm. I'm. Go We're going to narrow in on this, so I'm going to ask you some questions for um, for specifics. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, which castle am I attacking? Ooh, Bodium Castle. Bodium Castle. So wet moat. Uh huh. Four towers in the corners. <laughs> is has it got a? It's not got a postern gate, has I don't it? Know but what it's that got is. um. It's got a drawbridge. It's got a drawbridge. Think. Yeah, it's got a drawbridge. It's got tar holes. It's got tar holes, right? Um, it's got a World War Two machine gun in position. Yep. yep. <laughs> so I is it now? <laughs> am I attacking? It's got a tea shop. Am I attacking it now? Am I attacking at the height of Bodium Castle's sort of medieval yeah, powers? Definitely. So right. So the machine gun nest isn't a problem. No. Right. But the the big castle. But is. the big castle is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think I'm going to need something heavy, heavily armoured, but reasonably quick so that it can get over the um, drawbridge. Like, yeah, I need to break through the tree line, get over the drawbridge and smash down the door. So it is I can't remember the name of the dinosaur, so I'm gonna to have to look it up live, googling while I oh, do this. this. Shall uh, I just sing? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, is there anything else I've forgotten about Bodium Castle? Um, no. I'm surprised you haven't gone for some kind of dinosaur that could swim. Yeah. To get across the not moat. a dinosaur. The the, the 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 water ones and the flying ones are not technically dinosaurs. What are they? They're aquatic reptiles and stop, flying. Stop reptiles. wagging your finger, Google. I'm, I've managed to find <laughs> it. Um, I haven't got its name. <laughs> you oh, describe yeah, it. yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. Uh, can I have a look? Yeah, of course you can. So you I've need to decided audio, audio to go. Describe it. I've decided to go for a Pachycephalosaurus. A what now? A Pachycephalosaurus. It's got an egg on its head. It's not. That's its skull. It's a reinforced uh, <gasps> battering ram it's skull. It's got a helmet. Yes, essentially. It's bipedal. It's rapid. It's got a built-in battering ram on the top. But it's only the size of a dog. What? <laughs> oh, I thought they were bigger. <laughs> you lose. Bodium wins. No. All right, I'm having Triceratops. Oh, you can't back out of it. Yes, I can. You've just got a yappy little dog with a hat on. I thought Pachycephalosaurus were bigger. No, oh, boo. Fail. Sorry, mate. Right, I've lost the question. <laughs> I've lost the serious question again. Oh, all right. Stegosaurus, okay. though. Definitely Stegosaurus. No, lose. I've been um, riding it behind its, like, its frill. Like, <laughs> come on, then! <laughs> so, Christian, he says, he has a more serious question. He was like, is there any known instances... Um, no, sorry, I misread that. Is it, um, are there any known instances of archaeologists uncovering the remains of a modern crime? Of a modern crime? Yes. Well, we've spoken about this on the podcast with Liz Knox in her interview. Um, there are archaeologists who do forensic stuff. Uh, whether it's uncovering a crime, though, or because, like, is he talking about us just accidentally finding something in the ground? 
Well, uh, he, he does ask about murder specifically. <laughs> specifically in the like, but, have we ever like jimmied up a, a I guess found a yeah, yeah found yeah, a body yeah. under some floorboards. We've, we've moved a patio and been like, oh Ooh. no, um, gone full Brookside. Yeah, <laughs> there's a reference that most of the listeners won't get. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that obviously archaeologists have helped uncover evidence of crimes in things like um, uh, Yugoslavia and uh, Rwanda and various places like that when there are mass graves and they're trying to identify burial sites. And we cover this with Liz Knox. So if you want to ha hear more about that one, you can go back and listen to that interview. Um, other crimes, things like... Tax uh, dodging. Tax dodging. Yes, we found a lot of tax dodging. Um, but no, that's actually... like Crimes like people uh, claiming sites to be older than they are to make them tourist, oh, cool. <laughs> uh, tourist attractions. And then archaeologists have come in and been like, I think you might have built this, and you're a liar. I've definitely mentioned this before, but there's an episode... Isn't that the one with the stones? There's an episode of the yeah. Time Team, yeah, where they, they, they catch a guy because the barbed wire goes underneath the uh, ancient stones. <laughs> like, there's, no re there's no way this goes under here. You you are a fibber, and the guy's like, I oh, no, I don't know what you no, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I think yeah, it's stuff like that, you know. Uh, I think there are people. I I know this for a fact, but the British Army is actually looking to recruit archaeologists at the moment. What? Uh, wow. to help uh, protect and identify um, criminal activity on archaeological sites in Syria and. Iraq and Afghanistan. So how, you know, like, how do they? How do you mean? Well, because things like the um, uh, during the Iraq, the Second Iraq War, um, the National Museum was looted, and a lot of the um, artifacts ended up on the black market. And I believe the British Army is, you know, like that the movie, um, the Monument Men, from uh, about the there was a team of American GIs from World War Two who were tasked with uh, locating all of the art that the Nazis had looted. Well, there was a job um, thing went up where basically the British Army was saying, we, we're going to make a, a unit specifically to protect and um, recover art and archaeological artefacts. Um, because uh, people like ISIS who are well known for being iconoclasts, blowing up things like Palmyra. Mm. What they're less known, well known for is they blew up all of the big things because they were, you know, infidel and, and, and you know, against whatever pillicking thing they were nattering on about. But what they didn't mind uh, getting hold of was all of the movable small objects and they sold them uh, on the black market to... Make money. Like, to make money to help fund their activities. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's someone, I don't know who's got the job, but someone out there is, you had to be a member of the British Army Reserve and they'll they, they'll send you out looking for archaeology to bring back. Ooh. I know, there's a, there's, a, there's a movie in that in about yeah. 15 years. Also, the power of archaeology. The power of archaeology. Bringing down ISIS and their economic ways. <laughs> But yeah, any other crimes? Uh, just, I was going to say the crime of passion. <laughs> okay. But I, in my head, I've got to explain that. I'm, I was talking to someone about how uh, people apply for jobs in commercial archaeology. And the biggest crime on every CV is the sheer number of times people mention... I have a passion uh, for archaeology. I think that goes across the board Yeah, for that was in Amy Atkins' yeah. interview. I mentioned, uh, we talked about that. <laughs> it's like... I have a real passion. Yeah. yeah. I have an incredible passion for data entry. <laughs> I, uh, Some people do. I wake up every morning thinking, how can I do more double entry bookkeeping? <laughs> yeah. That's it. So that's the that's the questions for this month. Um month. For this episode. Uh Laura, thank you very much for helping. That's all right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You haven't got anything you want to plug? <laughs> no, I'm all right. Thanks. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, then. Um, if you can tell people that you enjoyed this, that's the wrong way of asking that. If you enjoyed this... <laughs> no, I like 
fuck it, going big with the yeah. assumption. Can you tell people you enjoyed this, whether you did or you didn't? <laughs> uh, but particularly if you did, um, try and see, you know, if you've got any friends who might be interested in it, uh, let them know, tell them about the, uh, 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 the Twitter handle so they can send questions of their own for future Q&As. Um, that is at Ask an Arc. Um, also, if you go on there, Occasionally, you will be asked to vote for who your favourite ugly animal is. Because uh, uh, I do some very strange public engagement work. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, till next time, thank you very much for listening to Ask an Archaeologist. I've been Paul Duncan McGarity. Bye-bye! Bye! You've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. The music you were listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at Ask an Arc, or you can send an email at askanarc at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself and you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful and much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an arc. Bye-bye. <laughs>